Good morning and welcome to the Health Leaders Healthcare Workforce Now Online Summit. My name is Carol Davis and I'm the nursing editor for Health Leaders. Over the next several hours, we will be bringing you thoughtful, insightful and engaging content that will explore key areas that are critical for the current and future success of your organization's workforce. Before we get into our opening panel session, I want to give a special thanks to our platinum sponsor, Olive, and our gold sponsor, Infor, for making this event possible. Also, a thank you to all our Health Leaders community for registering and participating. Kicking off our event this morning is our opening panel titled Streamlining Healthcare Operations to Address Burnout. The opening panel is sponsored by our platinum sponsor, Olive. Visit Olive today at www.oliveai.com. Thank you to our sponsor and to you in the audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping details. Our program this morning will be 60 minutes in length. Note that an on-demand version of this program will be available approximately one day after the completion of the event and can be accessed using the same login link that you used for the live program. To ensure that you can see all the content for the event, please maximize your event window and be sure to adjust your computer volume settings and or PC speakers for optimal sound quality. Next, you will find a resources list for today's webinar in the upper right of your screen. Here we have listed the webinar slide deck and other resources for you to interact with. At the bottom of your console are multiple widgets you can use. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation However, please note that it's likely that your questions will not be answered until the Q&A part of the program. Should you experience any technical difficulties during today's program and need assistance, please click on the help widget, which has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. And finally, this morning's session has been approved for one HRCI and SHRM credit hour. So please stay tuned at the end of the program for more details. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. First, we have Dr. Robert Bart, who is the Chief Medical Information Officer for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. We have Cheryl Reinking, DNP, RN, NEA, BC, the Chief Nursing Officer of El Camino Health. And we have Mike Baselli, who is the Senior Vice President and Evangelist of Olive. Thank you all for taking the time to speak with us today and with that, we're gonna get into our discussion. Healthcare workers are being asked to do more than ever, than ever before while being provided less time to do it, which causes stress and inevitably, inevitably burnout. Wondering where they will fill, what they will find the time to do it all, the organizations are seeking solutions that provide an answer so their employees can complete all the tasks asked of them. Today, this panel will look at ways in which streamlined workflows and technology can answer the need for efficiencies and avoid worker burnout. So we'll start with uh, Cheryl and Dr. Bart, and we'll start with Cheryl. And, and what ways are you seeing in your own organization that technology is helping to avoid burnout for clinicians? Uh, so uh, thank you, Carol. First of all, I'd just like to say that we're fortunate here at El Camino because we are in the heart of Silicon Valley in Mountain View, California, and have a long history of adopting technology. In fact, we were one of the first to have an electronic health record in 1971. So our staff here at El Camino are accustomed to early adoption of technology. However, our staff have become skeptical about what really does improve the patient experience and even more importantly for our staff, the caregiver experience in using technology. So as we have been long users of electronic health records, we have tried to optimize as much as possible um, our health record to make it, use, make it useful to our staff and add value to the patient experience as well as the staff experience. So one of the ways in which we do that is because we do give the a computer system, a lot of information about our patients. We want to glean those most important bits of information and make those actionable for our staff. 
So one example in which we've tried to do that is using machine learning, or some people refer to as artificial intelligence, to really try to get the information that's most important, that can really make a difference, add value to the outcomes of our patients. One thing that we've implemented here is a deterioration index in our EHR where the EHR is scanning our patient's records and highlighting and pulling out those things that are most important and significant and serving up to our caregivers which patients are at most risk for deteriorating. And then our electronic health record speaks to our communication device, um, which uh, we use here on a badge, and it alerts our staff that we may have a patient who's going to deteriorate soon and activates that staff to actually go and assess that patient before the patient begins a, a deterioration or change in condition and may need to uh, go to a higher level of care. That's one example that we've recently put into place within the last year and we've constantly been um, doing um, improvement in that process. And I, we think we've got it where we need it. We've reduced our codes outside the ICU and it's taken a lot less time for our caregivers to comb through information that um, normally would take a long period of time. But the machine in this situation is doing it for us. So that's just one example here at El Camino. Dr. Bart? Yeah, thank, thank you, Carol. And I agree with Cheryl um, around uh, EHR embedded tools uh, using uh, machine learning algorithms. I'll take the um, answer in a slightly different um, technology framework. You know, as you know, UPMC, or many of you may know, we have a large number of hospitals in Western and Central Pennsylvania with a small extension into Western New York and Western Maryland. And one of the things that we're really trying to do, given the um, staffing challenges and the increased length of stay related to COVID patients, which sort of creates a, a, a double whammy, so to speak, is we, we're really trying to effectively use, leverage machine learning algorithms to optimize the effective management and throughput of our patients across our whole system. Um, as opposed to, you know, when you're in, in less stressed periods of time where you have more capacity than patients, you don't really need to think about how do you move patients efficiently and effectively through a system. But as patient needs start to hit the capacity limits of an organization, you need to optimize for that. And leveraging tools that it's not just about right patient and right bed in this facility, it's the right patient in the right bed in the right hospital. And what we're really trying to do is take away a lot of the cognitive effort that both our clinicians and our administrators and our nurse leaders take in trying to make sure patient movement through the through our system is occurring and really trying to centralize that with machine learning and um, algorithms that help us drive the opportunities to optimize the effective management of moving patients through our through our care system um, that that into itself becomes a huge sort of relief that I, as an individual clinician, know that there are a whole group of people who are leveraging technology to actually take some of this administrative thought away from me so I can just focus on the clinical needs of the patient in front of me. Um, I think um, as we've tried to centralize and then get, get each of the hospitals to work in a as a collaborative node in our network as opposed to independent nodes, um, that's actually one of the things that's translated to, to decreasing stress across our system. And uh, a decrease in stress translates into decreasing burnout. The next question is generally, how open are healthcare clinicians to new technology? And Dr. Bart, I'll ask you to start with this one. Um, so uh, we have we have quite an innovative group of clinicians at UPMC, <laughs> um, and that's that's a history that, that predates me. Um, I, I've been here; my tenure is only four and a half years. But um, anytime there's a new technology, 
Um, let, let's take AR VR has become very topical, especially in the perioptics, using visualization to do overlays of radiographs with a patient, for example. Um, one of the challenges we have is that the technology is so early that almost every spe surgical specialty I work with in that space has a different company they're working with. And so it would be very challenging for UPMC to, to enter into adopting that new technology at a time where it's not working with one or two companies, but having to work with 10 or 12 different companies. And that's one example. The more challenging area is when you're trying to take what is relatively newer technology to UPMC, but not necessarily new to the healthcare industry, and you're trying to integrate that into pre-existing workflows. I think that type of adoption of technology is something that requires a lot more effort. And we, we still go back to the traditional method of identifying physician, nurse, and other clinician champions to help us move that into the environment. Um, for example, you know, voice technologies for voice to text have existed for a long time in healthcare. And, and now with the advent of continually improving natural language processing, the opportunity to actually make it really work well for you within the process of delivering care, within the workflow of care, not just for physicians, but for nurses too, that, that's really tangible today. But getting people to think about using something that they heard about five or six years ago, or have been even using for 10 years, to think of it differently, that sort of thought around technology can be a challenge in trying to get people to reinvest and reinvigorate in something they think that they already know about. But now it's actually at a point where it's truly usable. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Okay. So having to learn new tech skills and ways of working during, during the pandemic added to clinician stress levels, uh, how do you mitigate that particular stress? Cheryl, let's start with you on this one, please. So we all know um, how very, very stressful um, the pandemic has been to every clinician. Um, you know, we at El Camino were one of the first in the country to have um, admitted a community acquired COVID patient um, in 2020, in February of 2020. And you can imagine that at that time, the, there were so many unknowns about this disease. Um, and it was terribly frightening for our staff. But I have to tell you um, that they stepped up in ways that I can't even begin to articulate and became true innovators in caring for their patients, um, using technology and other kinds of tricks that nurses do <laughs> and physicians to care for patients while protecting themselves. And I have to say that's really an important feature um, that we focused on here at El Camino. And you've seen probably in the media, um, what nurses did to become very innovative. And they pulled IV pumps out of rooms. They pulled ventilators out of rooms so they could adjust settings, adjust drips outside the room so they didn't have to don and off and be exposed to COVID patients continuously while being in rooms. That's one of the things that happened very quickly. But how technology helped us, helped us with that is that when we do make those changes on those machines, having that data go seamlessly into our electronic health record through um, an interface so that every single manual change that is made on the machine doesn't have to be manually documented. So that was really important for our staff as the, as the pandemic really ramped up, that we had those features in place. Um, and that there were those automatic downloads of data like vital signs, waveforms, ventilator setting changes, all of those things make a huge difference in saving time because the donning and doffing of PPE takes a lot of extra time and of course the stress involved. Um, so that's just one of the examples of uh, the innovation uh, that uh, our nurses did during the beginning of the pandemic. 
Mike, what are you seeing with Olive as far as mitigating some of this stress? Well, thank you for that, Cheryl, or Carol, and, and Cheryl, thank you for your comments there to frame this up a bit. So at Olive, we're wildly passionate to create the Internet of Healthcare for our nation. We've seen it too many times, too many times over, not only with our own professional lives in this industry, but of course, us as patients or our family members as patients. A simple example of that, of, of, of seeing how disconnected the system is, why is, as I as a patient continue to fill out the same piece of paperwork over and over and over again? This is maddening. We are better than that as a nation. And we believe here at all that we have the ability, we have the technical, technological capabilities now to connect the disconnected and to unleash a trillion dollars of waste in our system and to give back to our healthcare workers the superhuman powers that they possess. We recognize there's about 16 million healthcare workers in our country. And unfortunately, 4 million of those healthcare workers are being treated as human routers. We aren't allowing their superhuman powers to be unleashed to truly move our industry as a leading industry. It's the biggest industry in our country. There's no reason why healthcare and healthcare innovation can't be the leader where every other industry looks to us. We have amazing minds. We have some of the most brilliant people in our country working in this industry. And we as technologists, we as the, the vendors, the, the people that are here to support the Sheryls and the Dr. Barts, we have to do better. We're failing the system. We need to create workflows and technologies that are connected, that are intuitive, that empower our healthcare workers to again, unleash those superhuman powers and to give, give them back the opportunity to move our industry forward. All right, if technology is causing stress rather than easing it, what are some of the other reasons in addition to having to learn new tech skills? And Mike, would you start us off with this one, please? Absolutely, and, and Dr. Bart really uh, teed it up at the beginning. He, he mentioned that uh, you know, we are asking of our healthcare workers to log into different systems, into different workflows, to click this button, to click that button. And again, I already said it and I'll say it again. We as the technology industry, we failed. We have not done a good enough job to deliver technology and innovation that allows these workers to truly uh, give what they are, are, are able to do. For instance, we have too many workflows. We have too many buttons to click, too many portals to go in and out of. And if, if we were able to connect the disconnected systems where each system might be able to work with one another. For instance, if I'm a patient at El Camino and I'm visiting Pittsburgh and I have some type of traumatic event there, I break my arm or whatnot, why, why isn't there in place where Dr. Bart and his staff can't quickly access my information as a patient, right? We need to be able to do that. That's causing stress on our healthcare workers. That is undue. We're better than that. I know we have the technology and the capabilities to deliver on what I just mentioned. It's up to us to continue to work together to empower these healthcare workers. So, be, you know, beyond learning new tech skills, we as an industry need to do better to deliver the technology and the seamless integration thereof to empower those workers. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Carol, if I I'm add to, to Mike's comments, you know, so I'm clinically, I'm a pediatric intensivist. Right. And so I trained long enough ago that the paper flow sheet that I used to work off of had this two by three foot clipboard. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and some of you who have worked in that environment can relate to it. And um, the reason I bring that up is, you know, if you look at the three major electronic health record vendors, you know, they at least two of them really grew in the mid to late 90s. And the metaphor for how we translated mm -hmm paper documentation to digital documentation, we actually kind of moved what we did on paper into what we did digitally. We didn't actually spend as much effort transforming how we document. And I, I'm, I think that's the, the gap that needs to occur that to really sort of, to, to Mike's point, unleashing some of the superhuman powers of our clinicians, we actually need to move away from that that sort of old paradigm that actually drift, drip, sort of drove the process of how we design. So I think that is starting to occur um, as we start to move into sort of omni-channel platforms with smartphones, other types of devices, as well as traditional laptops and computers. I think the other thing that, that's, a, that's a challenge is that, um, you know, our electronic health records here at UPMC are over 20 years old. They go back to the late 90s. And just like an old house, 
we just kept adding things to it, more layers of paint. And one of the things that, that um, our chief nurse executive, Holly Lawrence, has done is she's sort of peeled back like the admission database. We've been working with other healthcare systems on what would be the essential data set that you need to admit someone. Everybody has something they want to add as the years go by, but we no one's really stepped back and critically reviewed what is actually essential in the care delivery process. And I think it, it, what, what I need to do, part of my role, is to actually make sure that we're stripping things back to what's really required for the care delivery process. Um, and we're doing that not just for um, all the care delivery, but given some of the challenges unique to the, to the pandemic, you know, what really is needed in surge type of documentation to really minimize that stress as we try to deliver as much care as possible to as many people as possible. So, there, so different challenges for different times, but I think part of it too is as an industry is we've not taken the opportunity to optimize what we do for the metaphor of where we're working visually today. All right. So are there ways to incentivize pri uh, providers to use technology? And I'll ask you to start us off on this, Dr. Bart. I mean, you know, there, there definitely was, right? The, the Coming out of the High Tech Act in February of 2009, Meaningful Use came out of that. And that was a huge incentive by the federal government to really move all organizations to some sort of digital documentation of care delivery. Um, we can debate whether the criteria of what was meaningful use was appropriate or not. But I think one of the things that is clear is that um, the large predominance of healthcare in the US is delivered on some sort of digital documentation so solution. I, I think getting to the next step, which is moving people from being an entry user of the technologies that we use for clinical care to a higher functioning user, I think that's a place where we need to incentivize individuals to, to leverage them. I, and I'm not sure, you know, pe when people hear incentive, they think, money frequently. I think for a lot of my, the physicians, a lot of the nurses that we work with, one of the incentives they really want is I want more time. I want more efficiency, right? So out of every hour, if instead of 15 minutes of every hour being in front of a computer, can you get that down to 10 minutes? So I have a little bit more time in front of patients or for other duties that I need to do in my job. And I think that's an area where we really focus on um, some of the, um, I alluded to it earlier with some of the voice documentation tools. I think a lot of the natural language processing that's embedded in many of these voice tools today actually allow multiple things to happen in the process of that dictation into our system. Um, and the natural language processing allows you to pull out some of the critical diagnoses, some of the procedural events and things that actually then suffice much more of the billing criteria that allow a clinician to actually be done with what they need to do in a more efficient and short time frame. So I think it's not just about can I can I um, incentivize them in monetary matters, but the incentives of time and more efficiency. Can you can I actually walk out the door of the clinic at five thirty in the evening and not have to go home and do another hour of documentation? Right. That's one of the things that we're trying to achieve, and I think that's more about. Um, moving people to a higher level of use in sophistication of the electronic health records, but also providing better tools that allow them to more efficiently and effectively move through the health records. Mike, like to, what are your thoughts on that? It's 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 a great it's a great point from Dr. Bard, and I'd actually like to look at this uh, for coming from a technologist. I'm going to say something that is very orthogonal to who we are as technologists. I believe as, as to, if technologists can actually put technology in the background where you don't even realize that it's there mm -hmm. to then more importantly, bring joy back to the practice of delivering care. Imagine an opportunity where the technology is in the background. It has been removed from the barrier between the, the clinician and the patient. And joy is back in that very intimate and very sacred moment spent together. And to Dr. Bart's point, all of a sudden we can get that clinician back to their family a half hour early every day 
And every day they're showing up with a sense of joy and a sense of pride and a sense of mission. Because we as the technology industry have worked tirelessly to meet our mark to put innovation and technology in the background to again, get back to that very sacred moment of patient clinician interaction. Imagine, and I don't think we have to imagine, we can do this, but we have to work on doing it together. All right. So the next question is, um, whoops, skipped one here, pardon me. The Internet of Healthcare report from Wakefield Research says that 92% of clinicians agree that they spend too much time on administrative tasks, particularly with, particularly with manual data entry. What is the solution there? And Cheryl, I would like to ask you to start us off on this one. So I think Dr. Bart hit on this earlier and it's so important. And I just uh, wanna tell a little success story of uh, how particularly nurses who do enter a lot of data manually still into our electronic health record can make a difference in reducing the amount of time. Um, we see this as a, a, a tremendous issue in getting nurses and physicians back to the bedside is what we call it and less in front of the computer is just so essential to reduce burnout, to Im improve those relationships between patients and, and, uh, and their clinical caregivers. So the best way I can think about doing this right now and what we've done here at El Camino is put those frontline staff in the driver's seat. Have them actually optimize our electronic health record. Make sure that those redundant uh, data sets are out of there um, and that only those data that are required to effectively take care of the patient are what's required in our documentation. So um, you know, some of the health records actually have reports where you can see how many clicks each clinician has given. Um, and our committee that was um, uh, actually commissioned of direct care nurses have been looking at those reports and have combed through our um, admission database, our flow sheets, and just last year reduced the clicks of our clinicians by 400,000 clicks. So they're making progress. <laughs> they're not where they'd like to be, um, and they have a lot more work to do, but this was the frontline staff actually doing the work. They do the work every day. They know how to best ensure that the data that we're gathering is the most valuable. So that's one way in which um, we've felt that we were effective and continue to continuously improve what is really a concern for our clinicians here at El Camino. All right, younger healthcare workers are digital natives. Uh, they grew up in an environment where technology was omnipresent. So what lessons can be learned from healthcare's digital natives that can help the overall healthcare industry properly adopt and adapt and use technology to their advantage? And Mike, I'm gonna ask you to start us off on this one. I actually think there's a wonderful opportunity here for our industry. Let me shape it up a little bit and, and, and give the, the magnitude of the opportunity a hand here. Millennials are now the largest segment of our workforce. They are the largest segment in, of, of voter block in this country. They have huge and enormous potential and more importantly, power as a consumer in the marketplace. So as we continue to think about putting the consumer at the center of care, when we start thinking about migrating towards value-based care, this is gonna become more important than ever when we start thinking about what, how and what and when and where the consumer wants to be met by, the, to, by with, and to the healthcare industry. And so from my perspective, again, I think we have a huge opportunity here. Digital natives demand and expect ease of use of technology. For them, it doesn't make sense to digital natives to call a taxi company and schedule a ride that they hope will show up. And then when the taxi shows up, that they're expected to pay in cash. Digital natives don't even really touch cash anymore. They may pay their friend. I may go over to Dr. Bart's house or we go out to dinner and we split the bill. I might Venmo him. I never even touched cash, right? These are all digital native tools that they're just used to. They've come to expect that experience. And whether this industry likes it or not, I know that we are, how shall I say this? Uh, we are heavily uh, reliant on the notion of status quo and orthodoxy. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to break away from that because that largest segment of our workforce 
that largest voter block in our country, the millennials, they are going to demand and expect a new experience, whether our, the, the incumbent stakeholders in healthcare like it or not, they are going to come and demand and expect this. And we as an industry must learn from that and meet them where they are. So therefore, from my perspective, as leaders in this industry, let's lean on those digital natives. Let's ask them the questions. How can we get better? How can we take care of one another as colleagues in the, in the system? And then of course, most importantly, while we're all here in the first place, how can we better serve the consumer? Not the patient, the consumer. Because again, this is where we're heading, whether the industry likes it or not. Yeah, I, you know, Carol, let me add to Mike's comment because uh, uh, meeting the meeting the, the person where they are or, or the patient or consumer where they are is something that we're striving to do at UPMC. I think healthcare traditionally was a single channel process in the U.S., and we define the channel. And so here's our 1-800 number. This is how you're going to interact with us. That's the traditional mechanism. And in fact, if you go to most of the healthcare system websites today, that's still the main way they want you to interact with them. And I think that we need to become much more of an omni-channel and um, industry and meeting individuals where they need, they want to be met, um, whether it's virtually, in person, um, and that is not just in the initial administrative interaction, but even in the clinical interactions, we have to do that. We do have to d define, um, especially in the clinical uh, segment, we have to define some sort of guardrail because there are certain types of visits that really do need to occur in person. But we also have to have some latitude for those individuals who have certain preferences, um, as long as we feel like we can give them a good experience and meet their clinical needs, right? We have to make sure we, we maintain that. But I, I agree with Mike, we have to become much more omnichannel. One of the things that's, that's still sort of curious to me, when we look at the demographics of the patients that leverage our patient portal, um, it, it's interesting that those that use the application on a smartphone cover all the demographics that we deliver care to. But, but there's also a segment that even though instead of leveraging the native application, they actually use a web browser on their smartphone. And 50% of our patient portal access is through the web browser instead of the app. And it doesn't seem to have a huge age demographic difference, which, which is curious to me. Because I would have thought to, to Mike's point, that, that the younger individuals would be natively using the application because I thought that, I would think they'd be more app savvy, whereas the uh, more senior population would be using a web browser on their smartphone. But it doesn't seem to be true. Trying and, and that's one of the things we're trying to understand is how is how can we better meet you where you are to give you the information you need at the time you want it. I love it. Yes. Okay. How can e EHRs be used to reduce stress and burnout among doctors and nurses? Cheryl? Yeah, so I've thought a lot about this question and just um, how we use our EHR and how we should use it in the future um, and how it can be done, designed to um, actually um, add value and be more efficient for us and really help us focus on uh, the important things, the significant things for our patients. Now, one thing that some of the health records do have built in right now is clinical decision support. And that's helpful and effective, um, but not all the time. And I think Dr. Bart hit on that earlier where um, some of these, uh, what we call best practice alerts are built into our EHRs. So for example, if certain criteria are met, then a box pops up and says, hey, doctor, hey, nurse, did you want to do this or order this or document this um, in the electronic record? And it requires you to click and acknowledge or go off and do that thing it's suggesting. Now, those best practice alerts sometimes are really bothersome. They don't help. <laughs> they, in fact, annoy. And it does lead to stress and burnout because it takes more time. What you want to do is provide those alerts that really add meaning. That, you know, there is so much information going through clinicians' heads every day 
that sometimes those alerts are helpful, are effective, but you want a governance process where you're actually able to optimize the alerts, where you're serving up those alerts that are the most meaningful and that you have a process to do that. Um, and uh, here at El Camino, we're working on that. We do have alerts that are very annoying <laughs> that we are in the process of trying to take out of our system um, and continually try to reduce that clinical burnout of using the electronic health record. Um, so that's one example I would say in which uh, we can do better and optimize our systems to, to provide better care and less annoyance <laughs> for our clinicians. And I see Dr. Bart shaking his head, so I'm thinking he's agreeing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree with you, Cheryl. I think, you know, I, I've been doing this for quite a few years. And, you know, I think about the early days that we thought about decision support and we thought, oh yeah, we could do this and it's gonna be great. And, and what we were doing was we were creating actually something that fired as much more of a screening tool. So it might yeah. fire 5,000 times to capture one or two events that means you're disrupting, you know, 4,998 other individuals in their workflow without actually adding value to the workflow. Um, as I've thought about the, the foibles of decision support, um, it, it hasn't improved significantly over the last 20 years. And I think part of it is we're spending a lot of time on the clinical aspect of the decision support. Actually, we actually need to spend more time using machine learning on the context of decision support. It needs to know more about me, the clinician who's interacting it with the EHR, right? If it knows I'm a pediatric intensivist, this is my typical ordering behavior, this is what I, so if the algorithm knows that about me, but it also knows, has information about the patient, then the context of how the alert is fired becomes much more tuned to providing value in that circumstance. So it may know that, you know what, Dr. Bart doesn't need to see this gentamicin alert because he's already renally dose adjusted it, right? Because this individual's creatinine is 2.0. And, and I can see by the calculation, that's already been taken into account of. Whereas we today, we tend to fire that. Did you know that the creatinine's two? Well, I've, if I've accounted for it, you don't need to fire your alert for that. And so I think that as we get more context about who the individual within the EHR that's being interacted with for the alert, as well as the patient that alert is interacting on, as we get more context to tune it with machine learning, I think the value of decision support will go up significantly. And the, the, the nuisance alerts that Cheryl mentioned that disrupt workflow those will go away. And then the one time something fires in front of me, I'll say, oh yeah, I'm glad it did that. It kept me from making this error. I've not had that aha moment with almost any decision support, even though I'm a big advocate of decision support. Mm -hmm. Mike, would you weigh in on this as well, please? Yeah, I, I just want to add some support for, for the messages that both Cheryl and Dr. Bart shared because we at all have fully subscribed and fully agreed to that. But let me paint a picture of the art of the possible. And what I'm about to say is actually uh, the ability to place into reality, and it's the following. To Dr. Bart, Bart's point, we are, are, are in alert fatigue syndrome right now as an industry. But imagine if we were able to implement at scale across the industry for our 16 plus million healthcare workers the opportunity for AI, NLP, machine learning, and automation to work in harmony with one another. What do I mean by that? Let me place that into a real world example that many of us know today, Tesla. So when Cheryl takes her Tesla out in Mountain View, my Tesla in Denver is getting better, as so is Dr. Bart's over in, in Pennsylvania, and the vice versa. This networked effect of connected technology betters all. Imagine that environment in healthcare. Imagine where, you know, I'm a clinician and I'm working in the pediatric space and I'm interacting with a certain type of patient and I'm in Seattle. And imagine those interactions being able to teach some AI some, and, and create some automation for that same nurse down in Miami, Florida. Imagine this network effect where we all get better. This isn't a zero sum game. If we have an opportunity to have a truly connected healthcare industry, all of us are going to better and that includes the patient. 
these are this is the art of the possible that I like to share with folks and how this is already happening in our real world like a Tesla. But this opportunity is here in front of us right now in healthcare. And I, as a technologist and as an innovator, I could not be more excited with where we are at, but more importantly, with the possibility of where we can go and go together. All right, what effect is the rise of telehealth having on, on care provider stress and burnout? Dr. Bart, will you take the lead on this? Sure, um, thank you, Carol. I think, um, so uh, let's just sort of take the, the early, the first six months of the pandemic, because I think how, how clinicians view telehealth today is a little bit different than the initial six months. I think the initial six months, it actually decreased stress, decreased burnout. The fact that you could safely deliver care. Remember, none of us knew exactly when to quarantine, how to isolate. There wasn't enough personal protection equipment around. And uh, there were a lot of uh, clinicians who were healthy quarantined, meaning they could deliver care, but they weren't sure if they could be in the office. So having telemedicine at that time was a huge stress reliever because it allowed access to patients and allowed them to continue delivering care. And many of them knew that care needed to occur. And in fact, uh, UPMC, as well as many healthcare systems, were very innovative in where telehealth or telemedicine was performed. We, you know, we used it for virtual rounding of patients. We used it in the hospital to decrease PPE utilization. We used it in the traditional ambulatory models of telehealth. We put um, telehealth equipment on our county ambulances so we could take our ED physicians into the field. So there were a number of different flavors and it really decreased the stress. As knowledge about COVID-19 improved, and as the numbers of the pandemic or COVID positive patients decreased, then the fits and foibles of having technology between two individuals, that started to become a little bit more of an increase in stress. Because as we all know, technology doesn't work 100% of the time the same way that in person works 100% of the time in having a conversation. And so we, we had to really work on tuning and optimizing to decrease some of those frustration barriers that both clinicians as well as consumers had in those telemedicine interactions. And so I think that transiently, after the initial six months, depending on the features and function set that your telemedicine uh, provider had at the organization you worked at, there may have been different levels of stress. You know, we had a number of clinicians who wanted text to launch features because Going into the application was a little bit harder for certain patient populations. Getting a, a text and a link that they could butt hit and launch into the session was just a lot easier. And so I think depending on what your organization had, you may have had transient periods with increased stress. <clears throat> As the pandemic has started, or the COVID positive patients, at least in our region, have started to increase again through the fall, I think the frustration level and stressors related to telemedicine have started to subside again. We've, had, we've improved our technology, but also people are recognizing that there's a needed necessary place for it. And I think um, we're gonna see that cycle occur through the pandemic. Um, what I, one of the things I think is really sort of inspiring about telemedicine is that what has happened with telemedicine technology and functionality in the last 18 months is a compression of what the previous five to eight years had you know, features that many of myself and many of my colleagues have been asking for years were suddenly available in the last 18 months. And those are features that really aid the clinician in being more efficient in telemedicine. And that's one of the things that we're starting to really work through now at UPMC is how do we bake telemedicine into the care delivery process the same way that face-to-face -face visits have been baked into care delivery for the last 50 to 100 years. All right, well, staffing is a monumental challenge right now, especially for nursing, as I'm sure Cheryl knows. Uh, how can technology alleviate some of the stress that understaffing is causing? And so Cheryl, I'm gonna ask you to start us off on this one. Yes, this is certainly at the top of every nurse leader's mind across the country right now. And um, staffing the nursing workforce is, is incredibly challenging uh, for all of us and really looking at what causes um, our nurses um, the biggest headache um, and trying to 
ensure that nurses can maximize their workflows as much as possible as we um, face these understaffing challenges. So we've asked our nurses, you know, what are some of your greatest challenges? And communication, <laughs> effective communication amongst the teams is challenging and it takes time. And uh, one of the things that we've determined is that, of course, we've talked about the generations in our workforce um, and trying to appeal to the, the, uh, the millennials way of work and, and um, what we've determined is people don't wanna talk on the phone anymore. <laughs> and, and when busy clinicians want to talk to each other, they wanna do it usually through text. So we have, of course, begun our uh, secure messaging journey and really trying to integrate that platform with our EHR, with our on-call platforms. So all a nurse has to do is secure message and the right doctor actually gets the message, <laughs> which is one of the greatest challenges. And one of the greatest time uh, absorbers for the nurse is finding the right provider to talk to, to get help for their patient. So when we're able to integrate all of these systems together and the communication is smooth and timely, that is such a satisfier, I have to tell you, for, for our frontline staff. Um, and we, we're, we're really close to being there. We're not quite there yet. Um, but I think that that's one of those ways in which uh, ensuring that those wasted moments, and frankly, when a doctor who's not on call gets a text, gets very upset. <laughs> and, and that also adds to stress. Um, for our nurses. And so that's um, something that we don't want to have happen. Um, and we want to streamline that particular workflow. Uh, and we've, we've found ways to do it. And we think that will definitely help with some of our staffing challenges. I want to mention something else that we haven't talked about yet. And that is um, not just our nurses at the front line, but our nurse managers. Um, and nurse managers may have up to 100 and uh, plus staff to manage. Remember, they're really um, responsible for 24 seven operation of a unit, of a nursing unit. And they're also faced with huge challenges in communicating with all those staff as well across all three shifts, ensuring staff are engaged, ensuring staff get the information they need to provide effective care, to get the, the, the competencies completed, to get the education completed, so we're actually looking at a technology that helps to integrate all of our different management systems and serve up the information that our managers need to most effectively uh, manage their staff, potentially over 100 staff. And so we're looking at something that can integrate our time and attendance system, our uh, HR system, and pull that all that information together so that they're acting again, just like we're trying to do with the EHR on that most important information, communicating the most important information to our staff. I don't want us to forget about that. They're so important to the operations of our healthcare systems. So I wanted to mention that too. All right. Our next question is communication and collaboration appear to be a burnout antidote, antidote to care providers. What tech tools can help advance communication and collaboration? Mike, I'm gonna ask you to lead us off on this and we've got one more after this, so I'm gonna ask you all to uh, answer quickly. Thank you. I certainly will and of course now remember, let me preface, this is coming from a technologist and, 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 a, and a person that works for a high growth technology company. So from that perspective, here's some of our toolkit here at Olive. We love a, a, a technology called Miro. It's a visual collaboration and brainstorming board for distributed teams. Distributed teams are here to stay. Hybrid work is here to stay. Miro is a phenomenal tool, M-I-R-O. Slack, of course, is something that has completely transformed communication. Uh, I can tell you within our, uh, our own team here at Olive, we've seen emails just fall off the table, and that's a good thing because people cannot stand answering emails. I'll be the first one to raise my hand. So Slack is a great communication tool to unify teams and to unify messages in different channels. Of course, Asana or, Asana or Trello, great for project management, another great uh, tool that we use as well. Lattice, 
Lattice is a people management platform that allows team members to give praise and kudos to each other amongst many other functions. Oh, and it integrates beautifully with Slack. It's a phenomenal tool to give kudos to colleagues. And then of course, lastly, and something that we're wildly passionate about here at Olive, an AI digital coworker. We call her Olive and more pointed here at Olive, Olive Helps. It's a desktop application bringing and sourcing relevant information at the time of need to again, give our healthcare workers those superhuman powers that they so deserve as we continue our march to create the internet of healthcare for our country. All right, so our last question here, what new tools such as mobile health devices or apps or technology platforms offer the most potential to improving workflows and reducing stretch and, uh, stress in the future? And Dr. Bart, we'll ask you to wrap things up here. Okay. I'll, I'll actually, you know, both Cheryl and Mike in their most recent answers sort of touched on, on components of this. The, the parts of the challenge of, of technology and healthcare as it exists today is that it, it, it's quite segmented and siloed. And being able to have much more of an integration such that there is actually workflow integration is a large component of what needs to occur. Um, frequently, our nurses and physicians are having to log into multiple systems or um, log in, say, I'm here in this one, log in the next one, I'm here. So having that all tethered together and strung together so that there's one sort of interface that connects you with them, that would, that would go a long ways towards decreasing stress and allowing the technology, as Mike said earlier, to start to recede into the background a little bit as opposed to it being so forefront and heavy present. I think the other piece is it's not about new devices, but a lot of our technology also um, seems to be segmented by the device you start with. So if I start a workflow on a smartphone or a portable device, it doesn't seamlessly move to a desktop for me to complete it and vice versa. And it reminds me, um, one of the um, mobile phone companies had a commercial about the National Football League, and it sort of showed people watching an NFL game moving from a smartphone to a large TV back to a smartphone to another device. We actually need that fluidity in allowing our clinicians documentation and movement. We sort of, we start on something like on a smartphone and you're, you're you suddenly realize that that's not the easiest medium to actually do this longer note that I've started here, and I want to transfer it to the desktop. I can't do that seamlessly. I have to save it, I have to log in, bring it up later. And being able to actually do that in a very fluid manner, particularly with nurses who are starting to move more towards small devices and then back to the computers on wheels, it, it would be a lot easier and a lot less stressful if it was it was integrated as a single continuous workflow. So device management, as well as integrating the siloed system yeah. are the two biggest things that need to occur that would really decrease the stress of our clinicians. All right. Well, thank you all once again for an excellent discussion. This now brings us to the Q&A portion of the program. So we would now like to invite you to ask live questions of our speakers. As a reminder, to submit a question, click on the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. Please note that your questions will remain anonymous and will not be viewable by other audience members. So the first question we have here, actually this is for you, Mike. Are you focused on helping developers design and build background and ambient solutions? I'll make this quick uh, and thank you for the question, Carol, and to our audience member. Yes, we are, it's, a, it's our true platform for healthcare. For instance, again, in a layman's example, the Apple App Store truly transformed the planet. Truly in 2007, when Apple and Steve Jobs launched the iPhone and, and with the Apple App Store, it changed the world. We haven't done that in healthcare and we're doing that here at Olive and you can find more at olivehelps.com. Again, one word, olivehelps. Dot com, and we're empowering our developers. It doesn't matter who he or she is. It can be a healthcare worker. It can be an engineer. It doesn't matter. We have an entire loop development kit. Loop in our language means app, but in our, in our world, we have an entire kit for them to build applications to help give our healthcare workers superhuman powers. All of helps.com. All right. Our next question is, 
And Cheryl, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to take the lead on this one. And how do you all envision the reengagement of clinicians in performance, quality improvement, to ensure safe and effective care and outcomes? How can technology assist with this? Yes. So we um, at El Camino are constantly still. Um, bringing clinicians together to um, work on performance improvement and improving quality outcomes. We're on a high reliability journey here um, and certainly looking at tools to ensure that we're providing the highest effective um, care. And one thing that we have found that I would imagine many other healthcare organizations have found is that we actually have uh, clinicians who are more engaged <laughs> in improvement than ever before. And the reason is that they're attending because they can attend wherever they are. So Zoom and other platforms have allowed nurses on their couch in their pajamas <laughs> to and, and physicians to participate in improvement. And that technology right there, video conferencing, has drastically changed the uh, participation that we have seen at El Camino because you can do it from wherever. And we have learned some tools that we can use voting and such things within the platforms to really be able to engage because you can disengage <laughs> when you're on video conferencing. But, but we've tried to ensure that we, we build those tools in and that interactive uh, kind of communication using platforms to get the teams together, let's, let's use technology in that way. So we're communicating and really improving care together and it's working. Mike, would you like to wrap us up on this one, please? Yeah, absolutely, I agree as well, 100%. I mean, look where we are today. Here we are virtually uh, being able to uh, work together on this and engage with this amazing audience. Uh, th these are some of the things that are here to stay. I, I fully agree, whether it be you know a, a Zoom call with, uh, with patients or with colleagues, technologies like this are here to stay. But again, to come back to what I said earlier, we as innovators and we as technologists and, and companies like ours, we need to work tirelessly to put the technology in the background to further empower our clinicians so we can meet the mark and the need that this, this country so deserves and, and has right now in front of us. So, uh, of course, I'll, I'll end on this. Feel free. My, my contact information is listed in the, in the profile on LinkedIn and an email. Reach out to me. Let's continue the conversation. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. As noted in our introduction, today's HRCI and SHRM credit codes are now up on your screen. The HRCI number for this program is 576-878, and the SHRM code is 21-4X36W. Again, a slide with today's credit information is up on your screen. You'll also receive a follow-up email from health leaders within 24 hours that will contain today's credit information. In closing, please note that if you registered for the next webinar of the summit titled Making Platforms a Priority, the Role of Technology in the Evolution of the Healthcare Workforce, a live clickable link will appear at the conclusion of the session to take you directly over to that program. If you have not registered for that program and wish to attend, you will, you will need to click the link and fill out the registration form to gain access. I wanna thank our panelists once again for an excellent presentation. I would also like to thank our platinum sponsor, Olive, for making this morning's panel uh, possible. And finally, thank you to you in the audience for participating this morning. We hope you enjoyed the session and look forward to seeing you during other webinars for this summit.